So everything I need to know about where hip hop started, I'm going to find out. All the places where your family and friends probably told you to stay the hell away from <laughs> when you came to Los Angeles, that's where we go. My name is Joanna Abayi. I'm a journalist, entrepreneur and massive hip-hop fan. Hip-hop has made millionaires of people who started with nothing for over three decades now. And many of the biggest West Coast rap moguls from Dre to The Game and Kendrick Lamar have their roots here in Compton. What was it about this legendary place that made so many big money empires? Kudari Sababu is a stepdad of none other than Compton superstar, The Game. I want him to show me the notorious neighbourhoods where my heroes started out. Places that until now I only knew through their lyrics. This is where The Game grew up. That is Dr. Dre's old house. And 1612, this is the house where Kendrick Lamar grew up. Over to the left is Centennial High. The Bloods go there to Centennial. The local school Centennial High's most successful alumni include Dr. Dre and the reigning king of hip hop, Kendrick Lamar. And when Kendrick and Dre and those guys are coming up, you might have to go through two or three enemy territories or neighborhoods just to make it to school. Once you grow up in a place like this, making a record, that's nothing. It's the fearlessness of living in a place like this. That was kind of the birth of their grit. Yeah, I guess. that's where it came from. The areas that we've just witnessed, they do seem quite disadvantaged environments and certainly an element of poverty there. And it just actually makes real. So just looking at someone like Dr. Dre and Kendrick Lamont, where they came from and seeing how far they've managed to go actually does kind of highlight why they've become so business savvy and why they have put themselves in the place they're in. They really had nothing to lose. In fact, they had everything to gain from their, um, from their resilience and their tenacity and I guess their bravery in a way. I can't believe we're going to the site of the legendary Compton Swap Meet, a hip-hop institution where many of today's biggest moguls cut their teeth. I mean, this really was the proving ground uh, back in the day for all up-and-coming uh, hip-hop artists. And back in those days, they would actually sell records. Dre came from here, Cube came from here. You know, you, you want to find out if your music is hot. So you'd play you know, it here? So you come and you'd open the trunk, and the people listen to it. You might have some people dancing and partying in the parking lot. And you know, they want to know how to buy it. Yeah. Well, you, hey, $5, here's a cassette, here's a record. You know, this is where you get your grind on. And once it's hot at the Compton Swap Me, then it's going to be hot. And believe me, it was money to be made. And these guys realized that. If you're selling it for five bucks and you're pressing it up for 99 cent, that means that you're making profit. So slinging records at the swap meet was the start for lots of moguls. But there were other supporters giving hip hop a push towards commercial success. DJ Yessi Ortiz used the radio to help loads of artists on their way. They created a sound that Los Angeles needed, right? They weren't afraid to speak from the people, about the people within the community. It's hard to duplicate, but now you have Kendrick Lamar who did the same thing and is now doing it for the next generation. So how crucial is the radio and its role in building up the next music entrepreneur? First of all, you have the exposure of the masses of the millions of people in your market. Before Kendrick Lamar was Kendrick Lamar, he wasn't on the radio every single day. Yeah. I was on the, on the radio every single day. So I feel it's my duty to try and go and find them, whether yeah. it's a small time studio or in the city of Inglewood, Compton. Um, that's important for me. Going to places like Watts and Compton, you can completely understand why people here are so hell bent on being extremely successful and extremely rich because it feels like a place where if you are not those things there's not a lot left really for you to do hip hop is still a genre that although some of its moguls are, have gone absolutely you know skyrocketed in terms of wealth they still feel very ingrained in the very streets that raised them you guys are in the hood. Yeah. <laughs> right now we're in the hood. Yeah, you're you're in Inglewood, okay? okay? You guys heard about Inglewood. It's no joke in Inglewood. My name is Joanna Abayi. 
I'm a journalist, entrepreneur and massive hip-hop fan. We all know the Diddy's, Hoves and Drake's are making millions through their musical empires. But behind every hip-hop megastar, there's a team of producers. And now many are millionaire moguls in their own right. I'm excited to meet two of the best on the scene. Laurent Dobson is a CEO of 1500 or Nothing, an LA-based music collective with producers, songwriters and musicians all under one roof. This is such an impressive space. Yeah, Look this is... Look at all these flags. And this model is definitely working for them. 1500 or Nothing have worked with an enviable list of hip-hop acts. When we moved in, if I show you the before pictures, like, this used to be, like, office building, so we had to really imagine what we wanted to look like and, and we, we made it what it is. So Lux, take me back to the beginning of your journey. I was always told you can have anything you want, you just gotta work for it mm -hmm. and work harder and get good at something. You put 10,000 hours in something and then people want to pay you for it after that. So that was just my focus to get really good to make people want to pay me. So is that something that you think is really crucial about the music industry and, and hip hop in particular? I that mean, you have to be good at something? You gotta love it. Like I'll be doing music if I wasn't making money, yeah. regardless. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so I just always had a dream of me playing with all of my friends on tour. I started my 1500 circle where we're all friends, we're all family. We don't have any problems to where we fight over mm -hmm. stupid stuff because we're all family and we were all broke together anyway. So yeah. I just like to keep it, <laughs> keep way, it a family yeah. environment because it's, it's, it's crucial out here. There's a lot of cutthroat people out here. What does 1500 or nothing mean? You know, we got a production company, we're a publishing company, we got writers, we got a label and we got a school that we're starting, so it's just for anybody that's really, really good at music. That's just 1,500 or nothing. So you occupy the whole space? Yeah, I always wanted to have a studio in the hood because we're so connected to what's really going on. That's what sparks a lot of hit songs, you know, just real and the truth, so I like to be around, around the people, you know. I was so impressed by 1500 or nothing. Not only have they turned their beats into big bucks, they're also doing it on their own terms and creating the next generation of hip hop stars. I'm at the studio of Deputy, a hot producer of the moment and man behind one of the biggest tracks of 2015, Rihanna's Bitch Better Have My Money. The beat actually started in a really quiet environment, like which was my apartment. And, um... Kinda got this. So Rihanna's not the only person that you've worked with. So how do you um, forge those relationships to begin with? For me, it was just pretty much sending my beats out to, um, to different A&Rs, different managers. And um, you know, that allowed me to go in the studio like with artists like Wale, and then he'll put Neo on the record, or he'll put Rick Ross on the record. And before you know it, I've been able to work with all these different people that then creates relationships and gets you in the doors to make stuff like this happen. Do you think that hip hop has influenced your sort of inner entrepreneur? Yeah, I think it's important to just not, you know, um, only focus on one thing if you have a platform to do many things. You know, when you look at hip hop, the norm is to get money and spend money, you know, fancy cars, jewelry, blah, blah, blah. blah. And that side of it is cool, but it also um, made me realize that, you know, sometimes it's not the smartest thing because this music thing isn't, you know, forever. You know, you could be hot today and whack tomorrow. Um, the business doesn't care about anybody. You know, all they care about is the, the hits. Where's the hits going to come from? And it's important to understand how to, you know, utilize your money and how to kind of like make your money work for you. You can take your money and go into real estate. Um, you can go into investments. You know, there's, there's other avenues um, that you can take. You know, I have an artist um, that I'm working with. To me, that's another outlet. I'm investing in someone in, in, a, in a, a product. He's one of those people that just demonstrates that through hustling, 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 he then gets that big break, that, that track that, you know, propels him into a different space. And now he's already thinking about how he's going to expand his already existing with the biggest producer in the world don't mean you know music. Mm -hmm. And you hang out with the biggest director or fashion designer. Being beside the person that does it don't mean you can do it. My name is Joanna Abayi. 
I'm a journalist, entrepreneur and massive hip-hop fan. In hip-hop, image is everything, from glossy music videos to well-managed social media. In today's crowded market, being a great MC simply isn't enough. You have to be your own brand. I've come to the Grammys to get closer to some of my hip-hop heroes to find out the secret to their branding success. Okay, what are you doing? It's really all about talent. You know, if you make great music and you're innovative and if you're creative and if you know how to um, attack your art, you know, with creative ferocity, you'll be able to do what you gotta do. But it's a little harder than I thought. Well-maintained, untouchable images mean these guys are now superstars who don't need the hype. We've just been told that the likes of Usher and Pharrell probably won't be walking this red carpet. What it seems like is, you know, the higher you go up the food chain, the less you need to do red carpets like this, the less you need to talk to people like me. So if you think rapping and marketing have nothing in common, think again. Melissa Keklak, the branding guru behind hip-hop giants like Buster Rhymes and Kanye West, connects big companies with the hottest artists. And right now, hip-hop is the go-to genre for today's leading brands. Seems like everyone wants a piece of a hip-hop action. Why hip-hop? Hip-hop out of any music genre has always touched people directly. It's really starting at the streets and at the roots, and I feel like a lot of those artists get it, and they never lose sight of it, and they just bring it back to the streets in a bigger way. How does someone stay relevant? With music, you have to come with the whole package. You have to come with your social on point. You have to come with your music on point, your branding on point. You have to align yourself with different deals. You have to make sure you're part of streaming, you know? So there's a lot of different elements. If you hit all those checks, and you get all of that done, yeah, that's the way now people are seeing bigger, bigger profit. Every rap mogul wants the iconic Big Buck music video, which keeps them fresh and makes the right kind of statement. I've followed the career of director X and loved Drake's Hotline Bling video. I'm not surprised he's worked with the biggest hip hop stars and has even worked his magic on my video of the moment, Work, by Rihanna. The Rihanna video, work has dropped. Mm -hmm. You have just shot that, mm -hmm. directed that, mm -hmm. made it the magic that it is. <laughs> what was like? What was it like working with her? Um, is is she adding her kind of creative idea as well? As well, your... there's a there's a process with Rihanna and her team. Okay. As you move forward, she has her creative director, and mm -hmm. you know we're, we're talking and sending notes and sending pictures and back and forthing it. Then um, you know their team is very involved with styling. They're on top of styling, but again, they're handling it. She's got her hands all over the music, and you like the music, and you like her visuals because she's got her hands on the visuals. It all is her. And then when you have an artist like that, then I can walk into a situation thinking, all right, this isn't my taste, but this is what you like, and your audience likes what you like, so I can rock with it. You get a hit record, you're gonna ride that wave. What you really want to happen is you do a hit song and give it a great video, artistically sound. And then when that happens, people are like, oh, you really, you got something, huh? The music may drive your brand, but more importantly, creating, owning, and maintaining that brand is essential if you want to become a high net worth hip hop mogul. Be smart, use your brain, use your instinct. You don't have to show your titties to nobody. You don't have to, you just don't have to. My name is Joanna Abayi. I'm a journalist, entrepreneur and massive hip-hop fan. Women no longer need to be endorsed by male rappers to be successful. These days, they're creating their own empires. That's a big change from the days of MC Lights, one of the original pioneering female MCs. You've got to be super bad to compete. Mm -hmm. When I was younger, when I put in all of that work, I was so oblivious to it being hard because I am a woman. I don't know any other way to do it. I've always wanted to meet the woman behind some of hip hop's biggest stars. Hi, Hi how are Joanna, you? Nice to meet you, you as well, Thank you welcome. Thank you. Lynn Scott is a marketing genius. She's been responsible for creating some of the mega hip hop brands of the past 25 years. I worked with Jay-Z early on, on the Reasonable Doubt record. Were you like, absolutely? this guy's gonna... It was me, him, and Dame Dash, and one other person on a conference call. 
and they had called and they were like, we're not doing this anymore. We're gonna start Rockefeller. We're gonna start our own thing. And I mean, when I see him now, he, we, we have this thing, I'm like, and he's, he's like, you knew, you knew early on. I'm like, I absolutely knew it. Now, when we think about sort of uh, music moguls, you've got the likes of the Dr. J's, the P's, mm -hmm. the Jay-Z's. Unfortunately, we haven't got women quite in the same space as them. Why, why do you think that is? I don't think it's nowhere near equal to what it should be. Yeah. But I do believe that if a female artist goes, and, and I th again, I think Nikki is a perfect example, I think that the opportunities to be able to branch into other areas are endless. Where on the male hip hop side, it's a, you know, it's a crowded okay. field. It's a really crowded field. I remember Estelle from her time in London, where she was still considered underground. Now she's an LA-based savvy businesswoman working with the likes of Rick Ross and Kanye West. But she's not imitating them. She's creating her own brand and empire. So what do you think it is about hip hop that has born so many entrepreneurs, both female and male? We had to make our own because no one wanted to accept us. So you, we had to make our own. I was following the blueprint being physically made at the time by Puff owning the company, all the artist stuff, and you know, knowing who you are as a brand and knowing that you have to create a character and all that good stuff. I thought that's kind of the way to do it. And do you think that you, you could have done that in the UK? Nobody knew what to do with me. I was a short black girl with short black hair, skinny as hell from London, and they didn't know what to do with me because no one existed like me. And so I had to go make my own. I had to take pictures, I had to go record, I had to go figure this the fuck out. Mm. I had to be an entrepreneur when I didn't know what the word meant. Estelle confirmed her position as British hip hop royalty following her Grammy award winning collaboration with John Legend and Kanye West on the track American Boy. When I approached John Legend, being able to physically be in a studio with him and Kanye at the same time and listen to them talk, and he's learning from Ye and I'm learning from both of them, was just like a once in a lifetime moment. I'm gonna listen, I'm gonna sit, I'm just gonna absorb, absorb this. Yeah, because I wanted to know how to be great. Do you think in the UK that we we could have we could have that? Yeah, I think we have it. Okay. I think we have it. And and it and it wasn't specifically in hip hop. Mm -hmm. It's what hip hop's kind of evolved into, which is the grime scene. Yeah. You have your Wileys, your Boy Bernos, those guys' net worths are amazing. Yeah. And to me that's what it should be about. It's about stacking on a personal side, it's about stacking for your future. But as far as being a mogul, it's like creating something that is consistent and creating something that somebody else can look at as a template and follow, and they've done it. You've been in Empire, which is mm. one of the biggest shows here. Why do you think it's been so successful? Because it's the folklore. It's the, it's the stories that we hear about Puff and, and, and Shug and all these things and this hip hop and Ja Rule and do this hip hop really go like that? Yeah. Like, it's the mystery that Does no it? one actually Does it knows. Like Does it? It kind of goes like that. Yeah, a little bit. A um, little bit. <laughs> The game is clearly changing, and trailblazers like Estelle are creating a new blueprint for up-and-coming female rappers. Yo, at V is the Voltron crew. Talking that shit, we gon' roll on you. The game ain't nothing but a motherfucking battlefield, and we kill it, so don't run through, man. There isn't much and financially, how much has your life changed? Two million dollars a year. Walk in my yeah. shoes. You thought I was quitting the jokes on you, nigga. Laugh out loud. Got the crown, I can't pass my down. Demons in me can't catch my name my is Joanna Abayi. I'm a journalist, entrepreneur, a massive hip hop fan. The internet has opened a new frontier for hip hop. Tyler the Creator and Chance the Rapper are just two of the self made moguls taking advantage of new platforms. Marcus Hobson is the next level of online hip hop entrepreneur. He's a rapper, producer, and marketeer, and he's done it all from his bedroom. This one was delivered to my house. I have a fan who knew one of my friends, so they said, hey, can you please get this to Hobson? Amazing. Yeah. This one was done by a fan in the UK. Your fans are hardcore, dedicated fans. We've seen tattoos. Yes, I, I screenshotted about 80 of them right now. How do you get here? I didn't go to college, but I went to my own college, which was in my bedroom, of learning about the music industry, learning about music, learning why artists are great, why artists are not great, and then I come up with my own conclusion. I think what he's done is impressive and inspiring. He's got over half a million Twitter followers and 80 million views on YouTube. What Hobson has achieved is what many artists only dream of. This is where I do everything at. I spend mo um, usually about um, eight to ten hours a day in here, every day. And I want everything to be convenient for me. Okay, I will, I will give you a breakdown of what I do. 
The beat will start as this, just something very simple. Yeah, moving on to the second segment. I spit shit like I got chest congestions. You should have known to never neglect the reckless. Time to myself was the best suggestion. Sex before bed is sex for breakfast. The sound that you're hearing is the stress digested. You ever tell me a little... My whole life got to a point where I'm like, if you want something done, do it yourself. Do not depend on anybody, because if you, if you want somebody to make your beats and you're finding and you're waiting for Dr. Dre to come through the door going, hey, what's up, man? Yeah, I can make your beats. Come in here, man. You may, ne you may never get that call. How do you make a song that you put on YouTube and gets that kind of attention? You have to keep on putting songs out. Even if you, even if you know it may not be good, you have to find out what, the, what type of, what people like from you the most. And then you look at the whole entire music industry and say, what, what's not being done right now? What can I do to really just blow people's minds? But it's not just his clever marketing that got him over 500,000 downloads on his last album. Hopson has always had a business plan. I'm 30 years old. I moved from my mom's house when I was 29. I knew if I lived with my mom and we're going half and half on the rent, that makes it easy for me because I'd rather pay $500 rent than pay $1,000 rent when, when I could save that $500 and put some towards my music. So that, that, that was my system for a long time. And that's so I, so the money that I was making, I would just put it towards music, invest in videos, invest in cameras, and enhance my studio. And yeah, and, and, it, and it came out to be great. My accountants helped me get my first house. I have a freaking house and I'm like, damn, this is crazy. He's not your typical hip hop mogul. He spends most of his time longboarding up his road outside his house. Look how much fun he's having. You was selling out the Wembley Arena. I wasn't selling out the Wembley you Arena. Were? I saw you. No, I supported Jay Z at okay. the Wembley Arena. I could okay. stand there and gas like, yeah, I did it. <laughs> like. My name is Joanna Abey. I'm a journalist, entrepreneur, and massive hip-hop fan. I've loved Dizzy Rascal's music since his early days, and I think there's a lot of similarities between the rise of grime and the hip-hop megastructure. I catch Dizzy in LA. He has a Brit and Mercury Award-winning album, and I'm curious to know what he's learnt from the money-making empires of his stateside hip-hop counterparts. know you from, I guess, storming into the scene with I Love You. Right. right. So tell me about that time when you first came out. What was influencing your music and your hustle, if you like? My hustle. <laughs> I was into, I was on the underground UK pirate radio scene, where everyone books, which was, which consisted at that time, primarily probably uh, UK garage, drum and bass, dance hall. But I was also listening to things like Free Six Mafia, and obviously, loads of New York hip based hip hop and West Coast and that, but I was really into the down south crunk. When I eventually started making beats myself, that's the type of stuff I was trying to emulate. What was the grime scene like back then? Before I Love You, before when a lot of people were even picking up on it, like I wasn't called, it wasn't called grime, I was just making music and then it's become grime now. Now people are championing that. That same music put me on tour with Justin Timberlake. So now I'm being exposed to a whole different crowd, and now I'm like, oh, okay, I feel like I want to make music to make them go crazy too. Loads of grime artists have cited hip hop as an essential part of their musical upbringing, but the UK urban scene has grown so much that these artists command respect on both sides of the pond. Do you think that in the grime scene we can create the kind of um, entrepreneurs that have come out of hip hop? It's like with guys out here with big money, like, <laughs> for real. Our, our rise in the, as the UK, as far as urban music, has only really been in the last 10 years. We're always competing with Americans, like, like we we'll always come second to that, you know what I mean? You're talking about a, a, a huge, a mass, massive um, American capitalist mega structure that, that's, that, that's facilitated for this stuff. We haven't had that in the UK, but it, it, it feels just as big, it's, it's as important. The internet has just leveled the playing field. Like I said, people that might not have got the opportunity before to shine nowadays, like, People, people used to say that, ah, that we were like bedroom. We, like, people thought I made boy in the corner in the bedroom. And that. But now today is really that, like people can just become like overnight internet stars. With Drake joining forces with Boy Better Know and Section Boys, stars such as Lethal B, 
Stormzy and Tiny Temper's ever-growing empires, the opportunity to grow has never been greater. But Dizzy stands firm about what's most important to his success. The millionaire side of it, it's cool, it's nice to rap about it, but put it this way, you could be a millionaire, you could have all the money in the world, yeah? But you want to be the dude that's popping. You could buy as many cars, as many houses, you could buy a thing as, as you want, but you want to be popping. No one's in the club dancing, oh, I like this Dizzy song, yeah, he's got more money than them, I, I like it. No one's there rapping, celebrating oh, my money, no. They like the song because they like the song, innit? That's how it is.